we get a couple of minutes? Okay, well, I think you guys did an awesome job. Um, and you too. Thank yeah, you. thanks. So, um, you know, as an interventionally trained physician um, that's now just practicing cardiology in the community, one of the things that I hear is the age. So we, we're talking about 65-year-old, not 85. There's a big difference. But 65 years old in Arizona is middle-aged. We're treating people with structural heart. We're offering them valves. We have a lot of treatment options up until in their 90s, really. And if, of course, frailty has to come in because we're not going to offer people that are bedbound. We want to see a quality of life. So definitely, we're going to look at the constellation and the, and the quality of life. But when you're talking about the cost in the United States of medical care, this is going to be future. This is what we're finding. Genetics, AI, making these diagnoses are going to be what's in front of us. And so although the costs are astronomical now because of this one drug, as we get more competition, and hopefully, look, Amazon is now providing insulin for $35. We may have companies that say, you know what, we're going to go ahead and we're going to help these patients with these orphan diagnoses. So I think that as we expand and go into the genes and the genetics, we should be looking at all of these disease processes. We never withhold dialysis. We give patients until they want it. We ask them what they want as long as we're honest and give them all the risks and benefits of where we see them. I don't think there's a problem making the diagnosis. I agree that then the offering and seeing what we can do. But that's where I think as a society, we need to put pressure on the drug companies because we all know that's where the problems are. It's they're trying to make money and they're doing it at the expense of lives of our, our families and, and our patients. So, I, I, I completely agree with you, Dr. Agarwal. You know, I, I do a lot of geriatrics. I actually spend most of my career doing a lot of geriatrics. Um, you know, I, there's no way I can tell you that I have an 82 year old guy from Sun City that comes to my office, which is in the West Valley. Hey, Dr. Castro, how are you doing? I'm playing three rounds of golf a week. And, you know, when it comes to, to like that patient, I would offer him everything that I have, I would treat that patient based on, based on his functional status, not on his, you know, age. Age is just a number for that particular patient. I am not going to offer, you know, this life-saving therapies of 225K a year to somebody that is in a nursing home that I know that has a life expectancy of six months to live on palliative care. That's what we were pretty clear to make the point that we would just uh, carefully select and and these individuals that we are just considering, you know, screening for the disease, which actually I think at the screening level is actually pretty inexpensive. We were looking at the prices of free light chain and say it's like 150 bucks. PYP scan, I, I tried to look, it's just, I think it's 700. It's about, it's about the same as a yeah. stress test that stress we all do in our offices. Like you just have yeah. a different isotope. Yeah. And so all of us have the kit to do the testing. It just would be adding the isotope. You know, I, I think when we talk about treatment, you know, I don't particularly think when I talk to the patient, staffing is a classical, right? I have 82-year-old guys on staffings. Why? Even though the guidelines doesn't apply to patients over the age of 75, because actually I think it's unethical to give an 82-year-old guy staffing and give him some myalgia, right? But I would still treat them based on their functional status. If I, I want to just reduce their cardiovascular, so I, think, I think it's a risk-benefit ratio. You know, when it comes, I think we're all very frugal and very conscientious when we practice medicine. And I think we want to offer the best for the patients. When you look at the data on tafamidis, uh, they actually have better quality of life, which is very important, right? Even when you're talking palliative medicine and also reduce hospitalizations, you know, what the cost of hospitalization for heart failure, probably the most common DRG, you know, for hospitalizations in the country. So I think, uh, you know, it, it, it's, I feel lukewarm when I talk about screening, and I really take your point. Very excellent presentation. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are too nice to debate. So our rebuttal is actually the same argument as you guys, OK? We did not know what they were going to say. We were not allowed to see their slides. So I think at the end of the day, we all recognize that we have to screen the appropriate patient. So um, we argue 
as you guys do, that screening should not be geared towards only catching a rare disease in all patients. You need to consider the appropriate risk factors. Your screening should allow for the correct diagnosis of the underlying disease process, as we've already said. And if the patient screens positive for the disease, they need to have access to effective, affordable, and safe treatment options. Um, and again, screening should also take into account what matters most to the patient and their family. And so Dr. Soroff did an amazing job, again, educating the audience, and I just wanted to kind of reiterate and bring this point home that there are appropriate patients to screen and there's diagnostic clues to ATTR cardiomyopathy very much based on our own history exam and then imaging as we've emphasized over and over again. So again, as a heart failure cardiologist, if I see a patient who has heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, you know, I'm um, getting my echocardiogram, I'm seeing what my EKG looks like. Again, we've outlined kind of the low voltages in a thickened heart. Um, you know, patients who are not tolerating your conventional guideline-directed medical therapy for heart failure. Those neurological clues are key. If you have a patient with lumbar stenosis, carpal tunnel syndrome, um, tendon rupture, etc. Um, and again, as you go down this pathway, it'll be very important to make sure we're not over-treating or mistreating hypertensive heart disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, some of the other infiltrative cardiomyopathies. Um, the next several slides just focused on more of what's in the literature and diagnostic algorithms. Um, it kind of really nicely spelled out um, from one of the CERC papers on the different pathways of cardiac amyloidosis. Oh, thank you. Um, let me get to that slide then. So again, this can be a very confusing topic. You know, I often have to remind myself too as a heart failure cardiologist, like which type of amyloid am I dealing with? Um, and so this again is from a CERC paper and I really do encourage all of you to have this in your back pocket, especially as there's more awareness for this disease process. And you know, again, as Dr. Soroff already said, you wanna really delineate the hematologic Pre prevalent amyloidosis where we're talking about AL amyloid versus the TTR amyloids. And in the TTR amyloids, you really want to make sure that you differentiate wild type um, from mutant because they're going to have, you know, genetic testing and familial sort of um, implications that are going to be very important for our patients. Let me see if I can go back to one of the slides. Which one? Yep, you're back. Okay. Um, cause there was another slide, um, that I thought was important when I was putting the slide deck together. And again, there's so many different tests that are out there too. And again, it can be kind of confusing. Am I getting an echo? Am I getting an MRI? Am I doing this PYP scan that we keep talking about? And that's where you can really utilize the help of, you know, your friendly cardiologist, your friendly heart failure cardiologist, your geriatricians. Um, because as we learn more about the disease process, these patients are complicated and we really do have to work together to make sure that we diagnose them appropriately and give them the treatment that they need. Anything else? I, th I think you covered everything, uh, Amber. And to your point of sort of, um, I, I teach my fellows and residents, uh, what we're looking at life expectancy at this point, uh, we're gonna be looking at people 20 years uh, more in regard to life expectancy. And I think my point about screening everyone above the age of 65 is really that there is a big chunk which we really need to respect priorities, what matters to them, and understanding what is important to them and then make those decisions. So that's really from us. Thank you. Thank you.
Can you hear me now? No? Okay. So online Zoom, there's questions. The same one as that's on the tabletop. Please just answer those two questions. And if you have feedback, you can send those as well. So yeah, let's do, um, is this mic on? Okay. Um, yeah, let's do a little Q&A for um, um, five, five minutes or so, and then our judges will come back and give their feedback. So um, go ahead and raise your hand, and if you're online, uh, please post your question in the chat. So do you have a question? So there were two questions. I'll just repeat it for online audience. One question was, um, uh, what's wrong with just starting with screening um, to make a decision? And then the other question was, how do you know that 4% is really the right percentage of patients? So let me defer to our uh, panelists, so please. Yeah, we, we agree with your question. Excellent questions. Um, as I had said, depending on which study you're reading, right, the prevalence is kind of variable. So you're right, in patients who are over 85, what's quoted, 25% of patients have some evidence of amyloid um, in their heart at autopsy. Mm -hmm. So I think you're absolutely spot on. Now, from an advanced heart failure cardiologist perspective, like when we are screening that 90-year-old, it can bring some closure, but again, there's a lot of fear with that too of now you've been labeled with this diagnosis and depending on what their pre-morbid function was, um, sometimes a psychological burden is extreme. That's a great question. And again, I want to emphasize it's not really about age. Um, slide. In no way I want to reflect that a 90 or a 85 or a 100. We really have to look at the person's frailty status and general well-being of the person when we are deciding life expectancy. And the concept of life expectancy is important because when you're giving a treatment, you have to understand the lag time to benefit. That's another concept, right? If you are giving a treatment to a person who's gonna benefit the person at the five, month, five year mark or the seven year mark, mm -hmm. and the life expectancy is three years, then are we doing justice, right? Um, question to Amber, what is the usual time frame from the first clue that this could be amyloid, cardiomyopathy, and then the testing? How long does that take? Yeah, I mean, it depends on the center and it depends on the awareness. Um, at big centers, we might get patients who are in cardiogenic shock coming in with cardiac amyloidosis and it's too late. On the other hand, where there are centers of excellence for cardiac amyloidosis, those patients may get screened appropriately. The tricky thing with that is, you know, the drug studies actually do show uh, quick benefit which drug we're talking about again at six months mm -hmm. and the benefit may be persistent if you mm -hmm. get those patients who are NYHA class mm -hmm. two to three yep. without severe comorbidities. Yeah, so that's what I was gonna say that the benefit of the drug therapies, the unfolding of these proteins and actually allowing the nerves not to get um, the d deposition is, is so huge you can actually make a huge difference. And 65 years old is really nothing in, now. We're living such a long life and the, this, this debate was 65, I get it for 85, but we're talking about middle-aged people who play golf and who are here in Arizona. These tests, these screening tests are not in the whole big realm. We're screening everyone who comes in with shortness of breath with a CT scan to rule out PE on almost everybody. We're getting, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of testing and screening. 
this should also be a screening test. If you, if you have the constellation of these symptoms and what you're finding on your labs, and you have to actually think about it, and that's what these educational programs are for. So, it's a question back here, and then a question here after that. One of the uh, one of the other considerations with screening is if somebody presents with heart failure or with a cardiomyopathy, and you think they have amyloid when you see them, it's very difficult to know oftentimes whether they have wild type or hereditary without doing genetic testing. So we also have to consider the children if they have them, the offspring of, of who you might be screening. Because if somebody has hereditary uh, TTR, they, sh they probably want to know that. It's important for the kids to know that, right? So. Um, the only way that I've seen to reliably differentiate between wild type and hereditary clinically, at least have some sense of it, is if there are significant neurological issues. Um, otherwise, it's very difficult. So really, I would advocate for not only screening, but the, the necessity of doing genetic testing, particularly if they're offspring. I think that's a critical factor in considering how far screening and then how far to screen in terms of genetic testing. Okay, one more uh, comment or question and then we'll let the judges uh, present. Um, um, I want to just also point out that something that is not really life and death, mortality or life expectancy, uh, yes, it's debatable about the frailty, is it 65 or 85? The thing that I see a lot, I'm advanced heart failure cardiologist. My patient population, I'm a VA cardiologist are patients that most of the time they are in you know their 60s or 70s or 80s they are obese they are smokers the creatinine is three they have hypertension they have shortness of breath they come to see me and someone sometimes even in between and they thought about amyloid because it's okay there was a lvh report on the echocardiogram and already they came up with a positive stress test positive a pyp scan and they were thinking that, okay, so why, you know, this doctor is not treating my cardiac amyloid? And my debate, my presentation to them is that, let's assume that you are positive. Let's assume that that test is still is positive. When your creatinine is 3.5 and you're hypertensive and you're a smoker, treating your amyloid is not gonna make you feel better. And I think even it's not gonna make you live longer because that's the two things as a doctor I will do either I'm gonna make you feel better or live longer. You will die way before that, you know, the family is gonna really work on you. So I think one of the things that I'm debating against screening is that it's not about, oh, this patient is gonna to die tomorrow. No, this patient might be looking good, might have a five years of life expectancy or more, but when it has so many comorbidities, you put the diagnosis of amyloid, which is like fancier look, newer look, more expensive medication on top of the, something that you can easily treat. So instead of stop smoking, instead of let's give you some nifedipine to control your blood pressure, or let's you know, make sure the nephrology is on board. Oh, now we have amyloidosis diagnosis, and we have to treat you for it. Sometimes even I tell my patients, you know, I think that test is, could be even a true positive, but I'm not sure really I'm doing a service to you to even treat you for that. Why don't you just go back, come back and lose 20 pounds for me? Why don't you just quit the smoking? Let's see what your shortness of breath look like. Because if I treat you six months from now, still you're at the same stage. So one of the things also we need to emphasize, unless you're in a cardiogenic shock at the burned out heart, waiting for six months to treat in cardiac amyloidosis if someone is not having five types of hospitalizations and BMP is not like 5,000 and troponin is not like two, waiting for six months is not gonna make that much of a difference. I would say one of the arguments I have is that it just gives us a false hope that by finding a diagnosis and treating that, we're gonna take, we're gonna take care of the main problem because you know, cardiac amyloidosis is famous for having given you shortness of breath, but there are other things potentially causing that. No, no, we, I'm talking about when you have shortness of breath. It's, and lung cancer is different. The cardiac amyloidosis is not gonna kill you in six months 
unless you're in the very end stage, which probably you shouldn't even treat that, because then in that case, tefamidis actually defies the purpose, because if you're stage four, giving you tefamidis is kind of is not really useful for you. So if you're just having some symptoms, you think this is amyloid, you have six months to think about, go back and forth, treat the underlying cause, I'm all for improving quality of life, but I would say first, let the patient walk more, eat less, quit smoking, do this, see what happens, then go for next. Screening, gonna get in trouble. There you go. Now you guys are talking. Are you running out of time? So it's my turn now. So this is it. This is exactly what we wanted. We wanted you guys to debate among yourself, and you're doing it. This is fantastic. Are you guys having fun? Yeah. Isn't that the team A fantastic? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that team B even fantastic? Or <laughs> You know, this is it, right? In a debate, this is exactly what happens. You know, one team does good in something, the other team does better in some other. So we had some way to essentially uh, quantify uh, some of these measures. And so we looked at content, the accuracy of the content. We looked at the, the use of, uh, uh, of, of sound logic. And then in the delivery, we looked at the voice, the posture, the gesture, the, uh, the eye contact. We looked at the effective use of time. We looked at teamwork in your presentation. And then in the quality of slides, we looked at uh, whether they were too busy, whether uh, there was uh, you know, good audio, good visual, and whether it's relevant research, whether they're cited beautifully in almost every slide that I saw for team A. And then the analytical thinking, oh my God, did they do a good job in terms of their ability to focus on the critical issues in our lifetime across the board? And you heard Nimit kind of showing those beautiful two slides and dividing the old age into three different categories. And I thought, hey, old age is just old age. And here suddenly we are learning something brand new from him. And then we suddenly we looked at the logical and the coherence and the, and the development of the argument itself and, and the smooth transition from one to the other. And then all of this, when we put it all together and both Alexis and I, we scored it together. We thought, hey, in one of these criteria, team A did good. The other one, team B did good. And the quality is like, hey, team did? Oh, the analytical thing, team B did good. When we scored and actually measured it, guess what happened out there? Time. Well, we'll come to, no, hold on. We'll come to the rebuttal. <laughs> Now the rebuttal had separate scoring system. And, 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 and both teams really had some very powerful thought process. And, and to, to really summarize the rebuttal, uh, I thought, and both of us thought, that, uh, that, that Suzanne, you brought up uh, something futuristic. 
Uh, she talked about genes. She talked about the gene editing. That she talked about newer therapies that's coming. We talked about, hey, as with time, we know that all of these medications that cost us an arm and a leg uh, is slowly now coming down with time. And as you mentioned, oh, what if the family is was $5,000? Now would you screen more people, right? So many of this is all related to all of that relation. You brought that up beautifully. And then when you did the rebuttal, Amber, and, and, and Nimit, uh, you guys are fantastic in bringing up my favorite topic, quality. The quality adjusted life here. What a beautiful statistical terminology, you know. The cost per quality was fantastically mentioned. So in a sense, it looks like, my God, you did good, you did good. There is debate going on even now at the end of all of this between the audience and the audience scored, and we calculated that too. And, and we found something very powerful, something very important. So there is an African proverb. When two elephants fight, <laughs> it is the ground that suffers. <laughs> Number two, when you have to debate, you have to convince the audience, but many times you have to do it by confusing the audience. <laughs> And I think both of you did that beautifully, convince and confuse and convince again. And thirdly, as Woody Allen would say, we're standing right here, he would say, when you get to a crossroads, take it. So we are at crossroads. Why? Because the debate essentially was a topic that really didn't have one single answer, yay or nay. And with this debate, you could go this way or you could go that way. And both the sides essentially boil down to saying that yes, we had to use caution when we screen the elderly patients who have heart failure. And in a sense, we found the same thing. The scoring system with all of these categories was absolutely even. And guess what the audience score was? 50-50. No so in a sense, who benefited from this debate? The patients have benefited, the and the audience have benefited, and all of the people who have learned about the awareness and the knowledge have benefited. And I thank you, thank Suzanne you. and Michael, and I thank you, Amber and thank Nimit. You, I think it's fantastic. Thank you for coming, and thank you for really getting this together for all of us and supporting uh, from the bottom of my heart. And thanks to Sandesh for bringing us together. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So uh, this concludes our wonderful evening, and now we're going to hand out the prizes to the uh, the winners. Uh, so you have your booty bags. So thank you very much. Thank you. We're really um, honored um, for your participation and your brilliant insights. Um, and I have to say, it's it's amazing how far we've come. You guys have really are great students of medicine. So. Um, I really thank you for, for pulling this off. And we look forward to seeing the rest of you on November 8th for our next event. Um, if you have any suggestions, uh, please let us know. Uh, so thank you so much. This uh, ends our official uh, event, but happy to stick around. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We should start the program. Yeah, it's so nice working with you. Same. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. You get an honorary qualification. Thank you. Just trying to use some evidence. Hi there. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. And the questions are amazing, but you can't explain those heavy concepts in five minutes. It's impossible. I'm not looking forward to the idea of sort of like, let's just bring it up. Thank you. Thank you so much.